So give me an example of one of these models and the questions that you give the students to guide them through the analysis. Well, let's see. So <laughs> um, well, the one that I like is has to do with intermolecular interactions. And so there are different kinds of intermolecular interactions and they have different strengths mm -hmm. and produce bonds that have different bond energies. Well, let me see if I get this right. Ionic bonds, covalent bonds. Uh, well, then there's dipole-dipole interactions, okay. right? And okay. uh, Van der Waals interactions. Okay. There's London dispersion. It's all coming back to me. So, <laughs> so Troy and, and one of the postdocs we had working with us actually developed this program where you can take one atom and another atom and you can bring them together using the mouse and you can see how the energy is changing and how the force is changing as you bring them together. Mm -hmm. So you can explore what the, and you can then select the kind of force that you're exploring. And so you can actually see how the energy is changing, how it depends on distance, how the force is changing, how that depends on distance. And you can then figure out for yourself which one produces the strongest bonds, which forces are the strongest, uh, which ones have the longest range, which ones are the shortest range. So you would actually give them this piece of software that would do that. You would yeah. tell them, so select ionic yeah, we give bonds, them, we move ask them, them together, them. determine what the optimum distance or something is right, for the right, interaction. Right, 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 right. And they're learning based on, right. on that. And the ideal thing, and this is something for technology, you know, and they have this, you know, in, in medicine, you can actually have a mouse that has feedback in terms of force. Mm -hmm. So as the force gets stronger, you have to push harder. Oh. So we don't have that. We just have a regular mouse. But it would be nice to have that. So the students could actually feel the force okay. as well, just to see graphically what's happening. All right. Um, what was your biggest challenge in, in implementing this change? Well, the one I like as a as a big challenge was the perception of my colleagues when I first started this. So this mm -hmm. was in 1994. Uh, so I was chairman of the chemistry department, and I wanted to do something different when I went back to teaching because as chairman, the administration load is so heavy, and the, plus you're doing research uh, that. You don't, you're relieved of a teaching load. So mm -hmm. when I went back to teaching, I want to do something different. And so Dan Apple gave these seminars and inspired me. And so the summer after my term as chairman ended, I thought about what I wanted to do and proposed what I wanted to do to the faculty. And uh, I said to Professor Alexander, who was teaching general chemistry, the good news is I'm going to help you teach general chemistry. <laughs> the bad news is I want to try this experiment with these process workshop ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to have students working in groups and so forth. And he, uh, he didn't like the cooperative learning idea. He didn't think people learn by working together. That uh, He actually called it un-American. Oh. Uh, <laughs> now he's become one of the biggest supporters of this approach. Um, another one of my colleagues, uh, uh, called this Hansen's crazy idea. <laughs> Another one said lectures will never go out of style because it's the only way we can teach large numbers of students. Mm. And another colleague said, gee, you know, my job is to teach chemistry and not to teach these process skills. And over since that time, not only the chemistry faculty at Stony Brook have, have changed their perception just by seeing how well it's working, uh, but Rick Moog and I developed this uh, Pogo National Dissemination Project with NSF support. So n we now have thousands of people across the country, uh, mostly at liberal arts colleges, because people at research universities are much slower to change the mm -hmm. way they teach. Uh, They'd probably encounter the same <laughs> colleague comments that you did. They probably, and they, you know, they have they're putting in, you know, 110 percent of their time doing research and teaching and mm -hmm. thinking about how I'm going to change teaching takes some extra time. Right. Uh, but anyway, we now have thousands of what we call Pogo practitioners. And you can go to a conference, a chemistry conference, and you'll hear people, it's be, Pogo's become a word. You'll hear, hear people say, are you doing Pogo? And Not only a noun, <laughs> but a verb. Are you, are you Pogoing? Pogoing? Are you Pogoing? <laughs> <laughs> and an activity is referred to as a Pogo. Okay. Which Pogos are you using? <laughs> All right. So in terms of implementing it for the students, what challenges did you have? Well, the biggest one <coughs> was um, these comments that we got of hostility, you know, why, why are you making us do the work? You're being paid to teach us. Right. You didn't do this last year, why are you doing it now? Um, <coughs> and the graduate students who are teaching assistants even were, had negative attitudes about this, that this wasn't the way they learned. And, um, and they wanted to focus on content. And uh, I hit, my wife has a degree in education from the University of Minnesota, which is one of the leading institutions in education. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd go home and I'd tell her, well, here's what I'm facing. And she, 
and to deal with the graduate student issue, she said, well, why don't you start every session with an overhead transparency that was before PowerPoint <laughs> and say it's process, not content, mm -hmm. that's important. And so that's what I did, just to get them to focus on this other component that should be an intrinsic part of our curriculum. So what's next? Where are you going from here? So let me just follow up with that. That was the challenge starting. Now we have a lot of students who say they, the place they learn the most are in these workshops where they're working with other people, discussing things. There's an instructor there to facilitate when they get stuck. Um, and our uh, graduate teaching assistants who teach in these workshops, many of them are going on to professions in teaching where they're adopting these methods. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really been pleasurable seeing the growth and uh, the buy-in from both students and instructors. Uh, are you a lot happier with your own teaching? I find it more fun. Oh, it's <laughs> incomparably more enjoyable, interacting with people and having to be spontaneous, uh, addressing people's real issues as opposed to how do you get to the next sentence. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what, what you see is you're really helping students grow by developing their skills. Right. I mean, so f one of the things in, in solving problems uh, is to draw pictures. So you have a problem, st you have a problem statement uh, that you read and you don't really understand it. And students say, I can't do this problem. And I say, well, draw me a picture to represent what the problem is. And usually I have to humor them because they're not used to doing that. So after they've drawn a little diagram and filled in the numbers and so forth, I then say, now can you solve the problem? And they look at the diagram, they look at me and say, yeah. And then a couple of times they say, gee, you're a really good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I haven't done anything except get them to think about the problem in a productive way. And that works because they don't have to understand what I'm saying. They automatically understand because they've done it. The classic guide on the side. Right, right. So is this process still maturing? Are well, the new changes? Yeah, well, the new th thing that, that Troy and I have been battering, batting around is problem solving. So originally, when we started POGO, the whole activity design is to help students to develop a better understanding of concepts. And I think everybody involved assumed that then students would be able to solve problems better. So a problem in the general chemistry context is something has several parts, you have to use several concepts or several procedures to come up with a solution. And we thought if we did just improve their understanding, then they'd be able to solve these problems mm -hmm. better. And we found that while there is some improvement, it's not as great as we had hoped, and that's because there's a whole set of skills that are part of problem solving that aren't explicitly addressed or supported in one of our traditional POGO activities. So what we've been working on recently is what can we do, what kind of activities can we develop that really focus on developing these problem-solving skills. So when you've accomplished that, we'll have you back on the show and we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay. Right. Troy and Dave, thank you very much for joining me on today's show. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoyable. If you have any further questions or comments about today's show, please post them on our blog at tlt.stonybrook.edu. I'm Graham Glenn, and I hope you'll join us for another exciting episode of Innovations in Education.